Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Welcome to The Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. I'm really excited to have my special guest today. This is my first uh, sort of roundtable discussion with um, hardcore Bitcoin maximalist, Bitcoin realist, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, I'm here with Gigi, Matt, and Alex. Uh, with, uh, we made it with uh, four different time zones, or at least three. <laughs> and it made, me, it made me think a lot about time. Uh, because it was like midnight. What is it? Is it still midnight, like Saturday, midnight, Sunday? But it's but it's a.m. You know, so uh, it's one of the you know features of Bitcoin. So guys, um, I really welcome you. Why don't you just introduce yourself? I guess I don't need to introduce you, but uh, for the newbies or anybody who's listening for the first time, um, as you go along, I'm going to show some you know uh, articles and and Twitter stuff from you from you, so people know you know what uh, where to look for if they want to you know dig deeper. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, hey everyone, I'm I'm Gigi. I'll start since I'm the smallest fish here in the pond. And <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I'm just I'm just a Bitcoiner, and I started writing about Bitcoin about one and a half years ago or so. And um, yeah, I'm falling ever deeper down the rabbit hole and it seems like Bitcoin is my life currently and that's what I'm doing. Great. Oh, yeah. Matty, do you want to go next or do you want me to go next? I'll, I'll go next, fuck it. Maybe. Are you, Alex? Um, yeah, cool, man. Um, well, Alex, um, co-founder at Amber, trying to help people. I'm going to use Matt's term here help people stack sats and get into um bitcoin in a manner that's sensible uh and in a manner where you've got no excuses not to buy um not to buy bitcoin so apologies my video is going to be a little bit funny i'm still packing my um suitcase for bitcoin 2019 so i'm going to make the 14 15 hour long haul flight over tonight um, and try and be coherent for the next day so if you see me moving around whoever's watching the video um yeah, and, and I also look like a bum because <laughs> I was in the office all night last night um, prepping stuff, um, which we'll probably touch on today around privacy. And so good to be here. Thanks, um, gentlemen. Looking forward to meeting you in San Francisco, flying out 100%, man. myself. Shorter flight though, so. Yeah, lucky you. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm Matt O'Dell. I'm, I'm, I'm a Bitcoiner who, who has got, I guess I got pretty outspoken on Twitter and, uh, I, we have, I have a podcast where me and Marty bent, uh, once a week, uh, just cover all the, all the important things that have happened that week and try and, uh, educate new users who come into the space to, you know, to just beware all the pitfalls. There's so many pitfalls. My favorite fucking podcast. Yeah. Mine too. And thank you very speaking much. Speaking of pitfalls, you know, everyone's a scammer. Never forget that. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, listen, I mean, guys, you, you guys have really, I mean, with all your articles and, and podcasts and, you know, specialize, I mean, there's so many other people, of course, that I would want to mention now with it be Steve Levera, you know, totally specialized. Even he admits it's for medium and advanced people, like or at, you know, pretty much advanced people who are into Austrian economics. Uh, there's so many, you know, so much literature. Safed and Amus. It's it's all it's all about education. What I'm trying to do with my podcast uh, and my show is to you know from time to time zoom a little bit out because I, I have you know I'm trying to have uh, sort of empathy with the masses of the people who are totally overwhelmed with this with this realm of knowledge so I think it's important to break things down uh, you know not only technologically technically economically monetary you know uh, all these facets what what made what Bitcoin so my core is I see myself, you know, in this role, uh, in this educator role uh, to, you know, to connect the dots for the people, like to like to make it really like step by step. What is the top priority? And that is for me, uh, make Bitcoin the ultimate store of value. That's the ultimate, you know, uh, top priority for me to get as many people as possible uh, 
uh, you know, on board to make this really mass adopted by billions of people. And I think it's doable, but I think it's need a little bit more synergistic work. And that's why I think it's a great thing, you know, what we're doing, getting together and talking about, um, yeah, uh, Bitcoin and, 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 and uh, you know, and the vision and the ethos behind it. So my first question is, okay, uh, first of all, Bitcoin has been rising, uh, especially today. I don't know at what price, what is it? 10, 11,000 euros. So this is actually what, what counts uh, at the end of the day, people are like, you know, comparing or, or relating to it in a fiat currency, dollar, euro. And I hope one day it'll be like a second nature, a primary nature, and we won't be thinking or comparing it or, you know, relating it to fiat currency that is backed by nothing. Uh, so now that, you know, Mr. Zuckerberg has come out with this plan, with this gigantic plan uh, launching in 2020, the Libra, Global Coin, whatever you call it. And even Andreas Antonopoulos uh, forecasted in 2018 that there might be, you know, coming out a Facebook coin, a Facebook, whatever you call it. And then he asked the question, like, is it open? Is it neutral? Is it censorship resistant? Is it, to is it really decentralized? Uh, uh, and, you know, many, all, all these really uh, essential features that what's, what makes Bitcoin, if it's not, well, then it's not, you know, then it's, then it's centralized. And uh, it's, um, uh, and I call it, to be honest with you, I call it a surveillance cone, coin. But I think it, this might be really the, the, the real Trojan horse. Uh, and I think that could be a strategy, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, that we could exploit this, uh, uh, you know, this structure, this concept of, of Libra coin to bring, to educate the masses and to, you know, make it really mainstream, to make Bitcoin mainstream. What do you guys think? Hmm, there's a lot of uh, stuff to unpack here. Right? And um, I think you're right that it can be something of a Trojan horse. What I think is that people need to, for the first time maybe in their lives, really ask themselves some hard questions in regards to money. And we all did that uh, since we fell into the Bitcoin rabbit hole, but maybe the Facebook Libra coin uh, will have a similar effect that people ask themselves, why does this Facebook coin have value in the first place? And why does the euro or the dollar or whatever have value? I think that would be an important question to ask. And I hope that it's easier now to answer these questions than it was a couple of years ago, because there are now better educators, more resources online and so on. And also, you know, Matt and Marty, for example, they, they did an excellent job of just memifying the idea of um, stacking sets and just having hard money bit by bit flowing into your Bitcoin wallet and you build up your little personal Fort Knox over time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just add that, um, you know, I don't, it's yet to be seen if Libra will even get off the ground. Um, I, I think that their their plan of using a, a basket is, is probably a little bit too bold, um, especially in the, the regulatory climate that we currently have. You know, people don't like Facebook right now. Um, so, I mean, I, I would peg it at like 20% chance it even launches. But if it does launch, it's going to be riddled with all the same issues that have, have plagued our current payment systems. It's not like PayPal wants to block users. They have no choice. They have to comply. They have to block users. They have to make it really difficult with identification and whatnot. Um, so just as PayPal has been, um, you know, de every time a, a platform deplatforms someone, open networks get a huge PR boost from it. That's the advertisement. And we're seeing escalated uh, deplatforming events, you know, whether that's on Twitter, whether that's on Patreon, whether that's on PayPal. And as that continues, it will just, you know, as people get burned, they will learn. And that, that, that's the, the natural flow of, of adoption into, into Bitcoin and other open systems. Um, yeah, man, 100% agree. Um, I've, I've got a bunch of notes that I took here, Matt. Did you, did you want to add anything else to that or, um, it was all you, you have the floor. Cool, man. Sweet, sweet, sweet. All right. So, uh, the, the first thing Kev that you touched on was, um, about, you know, 
Bitcoin price shooting up last night and being the thing that matters to people. And um, and I had an interesting discussion yesterday. So, um, my my brother, he's um, he's like a, uh, I don't know how to describe him, like a, a mini. I don't know. He sees the world very much through the lens of like a Ray Dalio. So, you know, he, he, um, he, he's, he's quite a, um, quite a seasoned, uh, trader and, um, and, you know, he uses GIP models and all sorts of data and statistical analysis and all this sort of stuff to trade. And, and I've been on a crusade to try and convert him to Bitcoinism, um, for a while now. And, you know, stubborn motherfucker. He doesn't, he doesn't want to. Um, and, it was funny. We had a discussion yesterday, and and he sort of uh, it was around the uh, at the time of um you know uh, Bitcoin's price was I think it hit about five grand, and he shoots me a random message, and this was yeah whatever it was two months ago, and he shoots me a random message saying now might be a good time to buy Bitcoin. I was like, holy shit, what happened here? Um, I, I thought something changed, but he was just going off um, the GIP model and looking at what uh, quadrant um, the, you know, the US market and global markets were in and all that sort of stuff. And that's how he makes his decisions. And then, um, you know, at around the $7,000 mark, he's like, oh yeah, this is the time to get out of Bitcoin, right? Um, so, you know, n nothing fundamentally changes his viewpoint, but we had this sort of massive uh, rant back and forth on WhatsApp and trying to, you know, talk about you know, Bitcoin, not, not only as this investment thing, but, you know, you know, b being greater that and greater than that. And, and the, the piece that came out of that discussion was, um, you know, he said, I don't give a fuck if I buy Bitcoin or JP Morgan or whatever it is. He said, at the end of the day, he goes, you're looking to make alpha and he goes, you want to be up. And, um, I said, what, what are you measuring that alpha and what are you measuring that gain in at the end of the day, you know, where are you at? And he said, well, in us dollars, the only thing that matters. And, and I think that there is the fundamental disconnect because I said to him, I said, I, I don't, I'm not trying to measure my gain, um, in, in us dollars. I'm not going to, you know, go and sell my Bitcoin tomorrow and then try buy back in again and, and try fuck around with that whole, um, trading type mentality and trying to you know get alpha on the market because i can somehow outsmart the market i'm just gonna sit on this and i'm fundamentally trying to accumulate uh market share or territory uh in this uh, economic system that's bitcoin which is you know largely separate to all the other crap um that's going on and and i think you know this is probably and this is you know I'm going to assume that this is the mentality that you guys all take, but the, the further down, you know, the proverbial rabbit hole, um, we go, the, the more we move away from looking at it just as, you know, this, uh, investment instrument that, you know, you're going to make dollars from into, um, being this thing that <laughs> you want to trade your dollars for. And, you know, I love, uh, Matt's updates. And I think Gigi, I think you've built a little Twitter bot that shows the price of Satoshi's in different currencies. I, I didn't build it, but I retweeted off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Um, so it's, um, it, it's, it's this idea of, you know, step one for people. And, and this comes back to why I built Amber is step one is you need to give people some skin in the game. And fundamentally what people want is some, every human being wants a better future and, you know, giving them the opportunity to invest to, you know, to make upside, uh, provides light towards a better future. So that's sort of the first argument that we've got to get people into Bitcoin initially. Um, but then as you, um, go further and further down, you, you start to, you know, go where all of us are, which is the price doesn't matter outside of, how much you can accumulate and you know and what we're doing is we're not watching the bitcoin price go up we're watching the us dollar price crash against bitcoin <laughs> we're like fuck i gotta like <laughs> shovel the the bags of crap that i'm holding um and, and try and get into bitcoin so it's just the interesting um mindset because you know my brother is now interested in bitcoin whereas a year ago he wasn't but he's only interested in the sense of uh building up his us dollar stash um and and you know we, we couldn't be more opposed whereas um you know i would have been in his position a couple of years ago and, and it's just interesting taking people along that journey so i know that, that was just one thing i wanted to point out um initially i don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that before I yeah i um 
I, I tend to agree with everything you said, and I want to come back to what Matt said, uh, that people just need to get burned, it seems, and then they will learn. <laughs> it's just uh, the hot stove all over again. And um, I think people can get burned in multiple ways. In one way, um, if you're missing out on the immense gains, then you get burned in a way because you're missing out on the investment vehicle. But if you, for example, look at the protests in Hong Kong right now, people are getting burned by just their surveillance, um, quote unquote, cash that they are using. You know, they are using government mandated cards to buy their bus tickets and the train tickets. And now they are reverting back to um, a more private way of payments by just using regular cash. And cash, one, yeah. once you're getting burned in that way, then you're, I think, it's one way to wake up to Bitcoin as well. And granted, Bitcoin isn't perfectly private yet, but it's at least way better than having a Facebook coin or uh, getting banned by PayPal. So uh, I think that's important to point out that there are many ways to wake up to the beast that is Bitcoin. 100%. Um, I'm just writing another note here. I wanna, I wanna, when we touch on privacy, I want to talk about privacy, the protocol layer versus... Um, yeah, privacy is like uh, will be a it's going to be a I think a main topic, uh, especially uh, with you guys. Um, and it could be a good segue, yeah, into yeah. Well, I'll, I'll hit on um I'll hit on labor really quickly. So um, just I I had a um I've made friends with uh, a couple people in government down here. So I I went out on this crusade a little while ago to you know, beat the shit out of ICOs um, because I just, I, I, I hate the hypocrisy, you know, that came out of that space, which is they use the narrative of Bitcoin, which is the narrative of, you know, building a money for the people, introducing, you know, symmetry um, and, and all these sort of, you know, fundamentally um, uh, people, community um, and freedom oriented concepts. And, and they, they took those narratives and they basically printed, money um in the form of worthless tokens and dumped it on everyone um and then acted like they didn't know what the fuck they were doing and, and that sort of stuff pissed me off so um i wrote that submission to treasury because i wanted to see if we could um you know at least you know use uh like whilst i don't believe in regulation and all that sort of stuff i think you know there's um there's scope to uh wake wake up um you know, people who have the ability to stop those guys, um, you know, and put pressure on them at least, um, or at least tighten up the, um, the the guidelines so that they can't do that. So anyway, long story short, I met someone there who was, um, who was, you know, she, she was working there and I, and I can't dox her, but um, she she's like one of the smartest people. I, I didn't believe, or I didn't know that really, really intelligent people work that sort of, you know, those, those places. Um, and and we, we got into a bunch of really good, uh, conversations because she she in the same way just didn't understand the um you know why these icos you know existed and you know she, she had really actually done her research unlike most other government people who just have no fucking idea right and um and we we ended up getting into a conversation about bitcoin so and i've been on a crusade and i use this analogy a lot now is kind of like agent smith from the matrix you know when he goes in and like jabs his hand in people and turns them into agent smith i've sort of gone around doing that and trying to turn people into bitcoiners and um <laughs> you need to work on like, your analogies man that's horrible <laughs> i know man it's, it's the, i wish neo did that <laughs> so then it would be a bit nicer but anyway i i've um i've been trying to turn her into a bitcoiner and do you know what it's happened like she's now messaging me every day saying oh my god what about this oh my god what about that and i'll, I'll probably say you know the the experiment that I did with her in um in the boardroom, which was we we tried to design uh, from scratch what we thought a a an amazing or or a ideal monetary system monetary unit would look like. And you know in in the process of designing that, we basically describe Bitcoin. So that that that's an interesting experiment that um we're, we're going to co-write an article together about it, and I think it'll be a really cool resource that people can send around. But coming coming back to Libra is um uh we i think this is um potentially potentially bigger than um than a lot of people think and and not in when i say bigger not to give it any significance because it's got nothing 
to do with Bitcoin. Um, you know, it, it could not be more diametrically opposed um, to Bitcoin. But the interesting thing that Facebook has done here with this Libra coin, and you know, uh, this girl and I had a discussion about it because of um, what, you know the discussions they're having inside government with respect to Libra is. Libra had the chance, oh, sorry, Facebook had the chance to just roll out a payments platform. Uh, you know, they could have chucked a Venmo or a Alipay or whatever, WeChat Pay. Um, but they've decided to roll uh, a new form of money. And, and, and I think that uh, distinction there is um, really important to understand because that is, you know, quite honestly, the, the, where the big opportunity is. But it's also where the biggest challenge um, for Libra and Facebook is going to be because now what they're competing with is they're not necessarily competing with the Venmos of the world. Now they're actually trying to get up there and compete with um, what I would say is the, the nation states. And, and in particular, the, the smaller nation states that might have um, shitty currencies. So, so let's, let's say I'm some, I don't know, random country in South America or, you know, Asia or Eastern Europe or Africa or whatever that, that doesn't have a very strong currency. Um, let's say it's not part of the Euro. Um, and I have, you know, a large proportion of my population, um, you know, either on Facebook or WhatsApp, you know, th th these guys are going to, you know, be faced with almost a Faustian bargain, which is, you know, do we, do we allow for, you know, this new currency, which is, you know, not, not sovereign to be, um, to be allowed, you know, within our borders because, uh, you know, we want to, you know, increase tourism trade or whatever. Um, but by doing that, you know, they're going to create a run on their own worthless currency um, and, you know, basically effectively cause the, the, the collapse of their primary lever um, of control uh, inside their um, inside their borders. So, so it's, it's a very interesting um, thing. And, and then you've got the, the larger economies, you know, watching like so Australia's stance at the moment is that, you know, not a chance in hell are they going to allow it. But the, the question then becomes like, all right. Um, what does that mean? Are they giving, you know, significance to, you know, uh, Libra coin as a form of, um, you know, global money um, or, you know, are they going to pretend to ignore it? Like it, it's, th this, this is going to like pull up a lot of um, questions for government um, and, or, or sovereign states and how they um, deal with it. So there's, um, man, there's so much to unpack here. There's a bunch of points that I want to touch on, but it's like, do, do the little guys, um, do the little countries uh, embrace it or do they take it in and in the process basically, you know, have their own uh, economies collapse? And does that momentum give Facebook and that sort of consortium that Libra is enough momentum to, you know, go elsewhere? Or does that, you know, is that where they end up stopping? Um, you know, I wonder how this is going to like it all to me. And this is um, maybe echoes Matt's, you know, 20% um, chances of this succeeding. Maybe I'm at like 30 <laughs> um, because I mean, they, they seem to have the consortium around them to pull something like this off in some, some jurisdictions, but yeah, I, I wonder how that's going to, um, to play out. And, and the, the last bit I'll touch there is, um, you know, if it does work, then the way I kind of see this is, um, you know, altcoins and all the shit coinery of the, the last 10 years was kind of the warm up for Bitcoin. It was like the, you know, it was the first little bit of the stretch, um, you know, larger, uh, sovereign, uh, currencies are like the, um, you know, getting into it. And then Facebook coin, you know, if, if it becomes its own global sovereign, uh, or self-sovereign sort of, you know, asset um, or coin or currency, whatever we're going to call it. Um, that's potentially the, the, the big boss that, um, you know, that Bitcoin's going to have to knock out. Um, and it's just, you know, if you're a, if you're a shit coin holder or a bag holder or any of those ones, like you, you literally just got checkmated in one shot, assuming this, this goes out. Um, and it just kind of comes back to the, the wisdom and the intelligence of, how Bitcoin has rolled itself versus what all these other idiots have done trying to optimize for, um, you know, for speed or smart contracts or whatever the bullshit they've sold you, um, whilst, uh, compromising the one thing that makes Bitcoin diametrically opposed to all this other shit is the censorship resistance and being the money of the people. So anyway, that's one big rant about 
um, Libra would um would would love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Matt, go ahead. What's your thoughts? Uh, I, I first of all, I loved it. Very, uh, you really went into it. Um, I, you know, <laughs> I, I love the end. You, you finished off real nice and strong. It was nice bullish for Bitcoin and you know, all the shit coins are going to dump because of it. Um, I, I, I feel like we're almost wasting our time talking about it because I really don't think that, I think the the reason we haven't seen something like this to begin with is because government, the U S government specifically would, wouldn't allow it. Um, and I, I think that Facebook got, got bold. Um, Zuckerberg maybe got a little bit bored and, you know, he wanted, he wanted to be bold and he's, he's going for it so that, you know, but if, if, if they do somehow get this passed, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you were, if you were a person, um, in like a lot of American countries are a perfect example because they, many of them have weak economies. There's huge WhatsApp penetration. The key here is WhatsApp. Um, so it would be very useful to them, but so would, uh, any kind of USD payments through WhatsApp or, uh, you know, uh, Telegram's offering their shitcoin ICO. Uh, that's not really similar because it doesn't have that basket of currencies in the background. But if you had like a stable coin uh, or, or even just like a regular fiat rail that just went through any of these chat apps, like that's a very reasonable um, use case for people down there. But the question is, does the U.S. government allow it? And the question is, does... Uh, the government in question where the people are, what do they allow it? And uh, you know, Facebook is particularly well suited for that because people love WhatsApp. So you take away WhatsApp from them. It's like direct, like pretty obvious censorship. You start angering people. Yeah. Well, see what you just touched on there about the payment system. See, I'm still confused why Facebook just didn't roll a payment system and then just denominate it in us dollars or just um, create a version, you know, like a, a peg us dollar thing like because then then at least they would have had you know us guns behind them um in the process but rolling their own um thing like i, I just anyway th- that's where i think the that's where i think this whole thing falls in the too hard basket which is where i agree with you like um i think it's going to be really difficult for them to get it off the ground yeah what i, I just want to add is um oh continue um, i um yeah, I agree with the WhatsApp bit and the whole ecosystem is about 2.5 billion people, like 2.5 billion users, which is huge. And uh, you touched on WeChat previously, um, Alex, and I, I think WeChat works because it's just done in, in one big piece, like the government and uh, the companies work together. And I think that's also the reason why the Facebook coin will kind of fail, at least in the US, um, if they manage to start it. I, I agree with Matt with that the probability is kind of low that they will launch it. But again, uh, to and to bring it back a little bit to privacy, maybe, I think even if you look at China and that WeChat, if you're Chinese and you want to buy something that that is interesting, let's put it that way, you you probably won't buy it via WeChat. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's again, coming back to people getting burned and people also waking up to the, um, yeah, the essential freedom that privacy provides. And I think um, you really need to have privacy and also financial privacy to have freedom in a society. Otherwise you will always have a chilling effect. I mean, you can immediately tell that if, if you know that you're being surveilled, you're just, you behave very differently and you act very differently. And uh, every, everyone knows that uh, if you just watch people dancing, you know, there's this example and, and then you point out to them that there is a video camera or someone is watching them, they will just stop dancing and <laughs> look at you and behave very differently. And I think the same is true also for payments. I mean, uh, it's the same, it, it's the same is true for, for everything you do online as well. Matt, you wanted to uh, say something? Yeah, you actually got me, you got my brain running there. Uh, you know, maybe, first of all, I'm not sure if I, it definitely, there's some chilling effect, but I mean, people use surveilled payment systems every day. You know, all my friends, all they do is use Venmo. Uh, people, tons of people in China, the number one payment system is, is WePay, right? So people are using it even though it's getting surveilled. 
That's no, true, no. but but uh, to bring back the point from before, in Hong Kong, they're not using it anymore because right, now right. it's hitting the fan. And I think something like that wakes people up. Yeah, no, the people, certain people get awakened and as they get burned, they get more awakened. But what I was going to say there is there is an interesting angle here for Facebook to, to pitch it to Latin American countries, governments and whatnot as basically a way for them to get a surveillance payment system in place um, because there's no built-in privacy to it. So they, they could basically, those governments could get transaction data, get all the data they need without Facebook explicitly giving it to them, almost giving them like quasi we, we pay style surveillance. Yep. That could be a good, good way to, to promote it to those governments over like some kind of purely uh, just traditional payment rail centralized system. Hmm, yeah, I mean, now, now you're giving them ideas. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe that's their plan all along, you know? I, I mean, I, they, they have done more nef nefarious things in the past, I would say. So it wouldn't surprise that, me at all. Matt, so I'm, I'm going to just try and nuance that a little bit. Are you saying that because they're saying this is going to be some form of um, publicly accessible ledger so so in a way they're they're doing it but uh doing it under the guise of oh hey we're, we're doing nothing different to what bitcoin's providing um it's it's a public ledger so as a result you know gi giving everyone surveillance is that is that how you think they'll approach it i'm, I'm basically like gg just gave me like he inspired that thought that line of thought and if you combine that uh, the transparency of the ledger with the fact that they have all the Facebook data, the WhatsApp data, the Instagram data, um, you know, there could be an interesting argument there. They could actually, and, and at the same time, you know, they're not necessarily breaking any privacy regulations because they're not sharing that data. It's yeah, just correct. Yeah. Accessible. So uh, can I ask you just uh, for clarity? So, um, they, uh, Zuckerberg or whatever, he's just a puppet for me, but uh, they couldn't have, uh, you know, even tried to launch this without the blessing of the, whatever you call it, multi-corporate governmental deep state uh, uh, structures. Is that it? Oh, I mean, I'm not going that far. <laughs> <laughs> just asking. I mean, uh, what's the bigger, you know, plan here I mean, is we, there... we'll have to see if if the u.s government is serious about investigating this and because they I, I, again i agree with matt that it's it's not a given that the whole coin will launch but uh to to come back to what you said about the surveillance possibilities what i really hope and what what really gives me hope is that more and more people are kind of waking waking up to the fact that we need to do some kind of digital hygiene and I, I think calling it digital hygiene is already going like 50% uh, of the way there because it, it's, it's kind of obvious what it means because not too long ago, people just were dying left and right because doctors weren't washing their hands. And I feel like in the digital world, we are now uh, at a stage where people are quote unquote dying left and right online because doctors and they themselves and yeah the doctor equivalents in 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 cyberspace are not washing their hands and i think that or i hope at least that uh digital hygiene will improve over the next couple of years or over the next couple of decades i have no idea how long it will take but i really hope that um you know just it, if, if we stay in in the bitcoin world that every wallet for example will mix all the coins by default and you will just have private money by default every password manager you use will use a new password for a new account by default and i think apple is uh, doing a cool thing as well there and uh, where you just generate an anonymous email for every service you sign up by default and i really hope that it's going in that direction and that every payment system that's not doing that like facebook coin um that people kind of require some form of privacy there and some form of digital hygiene there. And I, I, I really hope that this would be pushed more from a societal standpoint as well, just like real hygiene. I mean, if someone hasn't showered for a week, you probably, you will at least look at him weird and <laughs> be like, dude, come on, change your password. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. I, I really hope that, um, 
yeah, this this will work out well in the next couple of years. And that it should become like a sort of a standard default without having people think about it even like uh, you know uh, it should yeah, just, exactly. it, you know taken for granted uh, this it's is kind of like https in the browsers now i mean if if something is not https then people are like okay um that's weird um because also the browsers evolved that everything has now like big alerts and warning signs if something is not encrypted if it's not encrypted communication and i hope that the same will happen also with payments and other things so that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that Facebook is on the right track there. Uh, maybe Apple is, but I don't know. Cool, man. What are, what are the, okay, let me recapitulate maybe for listeners. What are the uh, only options right now to, you know, to, to anonymously, like w without any KYC, uh, you know, stack up some sets, uh, what what options p do people have? What are the applications that are dis as dis you know disposable? Uh, uh, disposable. As far as I know, as far as I know, it's hodl hodl and disk. If you're going to be buying, and then other than that, getting paid in Bitcoin. Then I mean that that's the, from my understanding. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think there's much from a um <laughs> from an on ramp standpoint. It's really hard. And mining, obviously. Mm -hmm. Oh, and mining, yeah, of course, yeah, too sure. That's one of the be beauties of proof of work is that is that anyone can plug in hardware and and start getting some KYC free Bitcoin. Hundred percent. And then I mean, do you know what the other one actually is? You know, as as Lightning evolves as a thing, um, the ability. So so I I kind of called it. Um, you know what happens when everyone in the world becomes um, or has the opportunity to become a payment processor? Because effectively, that's what you are when you're a node on Lightning. You're, you're performing three functions. You can read, you can write, and you can route. Um, and, you know, we, you know, I, I don't know whether Lightning is going to, you know, build up in a way that, you know, by right, by routing, you, you, you know, you're able to, um, to accumulate fees. But, but I think there, there'll be some interesting business models there that were, um, that are unknown to us at this point in time as well, um, or, or ways of earning, earning Bitcoin that are unknown to us. I would assume. Well I, I think I think also we'll see we'll see like a lot of small businesses like offer discounts for paying and getting paid in Bitcoin and not like any of that BitPay nonsense where it's automatically converted. Um, they're gonna yeah, yeah. They're gonna hodl the Bitcoin, so they're willing to give the discount because they want that KYC free Bitcoin. Hell yeah. Yeah, and even if you're on the ramp uh, using a KYC service, there's always the option of removing the kyc part after the fact if you mix your coins or do some yeah privacy conscious transactions you know the rate of speed of development is like super fast and i'm really amazed at at this you know at this development or this process of of development uh, can we talk a little bit about blockstream g10 meshwork i mean is that like in the far future because this means like, I mean, I call it space transactions, you know, because this is like the total independence. I mean, the question that I'm asking is who is controlling the hardware of the satellite and the, you know, and the interconnected stuff. Uh, I'm not technical, but what's your opinion on that? I mean, how far into the future are we? Are, are, like, yeah, detached? I'm, I'm constantly blown away by the um, pace of progress. I mean, just look at the Lightning Network, for example, a little over a year, it was, uh, it didn't exist. And now look where we are at. I mean, it's, it's kind of insane. And also in regards to privacy, what the guys from Wasabi and also from Samurai are doing is really impressive. And uh, Wasabi is just an excellent wallet to use. And I think it's, um, I mean, if, if you can, I don't know, in, if, if you can, use something uh yeah if, <laughs> if you can use an uh, a program that's a little bit more complicated than ms paint maybe then you're good to use wasabi so it's 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 super easy and uh samurai is now doing well cool on mobile and i think everything is going in the right direction there and what you mentioned in terms of mesh networking um, I think this will come as well. And I, I think Matt knows way more about this as, uh, than I do. I, I didn't have the pleasure yet to play around with a Gotenna. Yeah, so I think um, I think that the, 
the well first of all the satellite is already good to go it works people are using it um it's it's a receive only stream so you're receiving uh from the satellite uh so you're able to get block data and those those uh messages those messages that they are allowing you to pay for through lightning uh through through the internet you pay for that through the internet but the the satellite is sending down block data and sending down those messages. Um, so anyone can do that right now. It's really nice as um, I think that the biggest use case for it is, well, first of all, it allows you to receive blocks um, because it's a passive process. It's very private. So you can have a full node without anyone know you're actually downloading blocks um, because, you know, downloading blocks is so bandwidth intensive. And then the second thing is uh, it gives you a redundant, uh, it gives you redundant block data because there's there's an attack um, that can exist with these with these networks where where your node is surrounded by malicious nodes and you get fed bad block data. This was when um, when Coinbase got double spent with the Ethereum Classic. It was theorized that they only had like one or two nodes and they got surrounded by a bunch of malicious nodes that were feeding them the incorrect data. If they had a satellite link as well. They could be working the block data across from each other, and as long as they they they're you know they're kind of trusting Blockstream to be honest there, but only in the case of a disagreement. If there's a disagreement, then they know something's up. They know either Blockstream's messing with them or um, their their node is eclipsed by by a bunch of other nodes. Um, as far as the mesh work, uh, it is moving at a very quick pace. Uh, I, I I saw. I'm, I'm good friends with Richard Myers, who's, who's leading, um, I, I forget the name, I, is it called Block Mesh Labs? He has a, he has a new, Lot, Lot 47 Block Mesh Labs. I um, think so, or is it called? That's a plan. Yeah. So the biggest issue with these, the biggest issue is with the mesh devices, it's almost, um, the, the ideal situation with the mesh devices is if you could have it, uh, if you basically in a, in a failure mode where you can't send a transaction through a normal means through the internet, you can send it through the mesh devices. And just like with, with something like Bitcoin, you have an issue where the nodes aren't directly incentivized. So you have to hope that you have to have enough part, you know, the network has to be built out where people are actually running these relay nodes uh, for the mesh network. And he is working on a protocol. Um, he just presented a paper on it to basically incentivize those nodes through the lightning network by paying them um, to, to route payment or to route messages. Um, so, so that would be a huge step forward. Basically then you, you would move from hobbyists or like people that absolutely need it, like in like disaster zones and stuff like that, it works really well because people, you know, obviously they, they, there's a priority there to, to run these devices. Um, but if, if, if we could get ways to, to trust minimize fashion pay node operators um, and Bitcoin's the ideal currency for that, uh, then we could really see these mesh networks take off. And, and, and you basically have this issue right now where the way people get internet is usually centralized at the last mile, the last two miles. So you really, you, you could have some mesh nodes connected to the internet at different points. You just want to really, the really important thing is, is distributing that, that last couple of miles to that, to the house or wherever you are. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what's the, what, what do you think is the roadmap? I mean, in the next four or five years, is that realistic? Or, I mean, is the ultimate plan like step-by-step step to have more and more people, millions of people having, first of all, their own nodes, their own full node? It, just breaking it down a little bit, trying to break it out for the, you know, more and more people to, to a little bit follow up on, on what you're saying. Uh, what would be the roadmap in Matt, in your, or Alex, I'm sorry, I have to unmute you because of a little bit too much background noise of packing. <laughs> um, or Gigi. Um, so what, I mean, so what I, what I envision is I envision that everyone um, or at least Oh, by the way, I looked it up. It's Global Mesh Labs, and it's the Lot 49 protocol. So I was close. Um, but that's a very exciting project. It was, he was just announced it recently. Um, so what I envision is that, like, the head of the household, um, you know, uh, for friends and family, runs a node. And this device is their Bitcoin node. It's their Lightning node. 
Um, and it could be nodes for all different stuff, you know, whether that's Tor or future uh, privacy network, uh, whether that's storage, whatever it is, it's, 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 their, it's their device that they are operating. And on that, you, would, you could add other connection mechanisms. So like most people aren't going to be using like a satellite downlink, um, but they'll, they'll, they'll probably have one or two mesh antennas on there. And it'll automatically switch over to them. Uh, it'll also operate as um, sort of a bridge node. So if other people are sending mesh transactions and you still have internet, then it could go through the mesh to you and then you can broadcast it out and get paid in return for that. And um, yeah, and, and it should all be, you know, relatively seamless in that, in that handover process or whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, Adam, back yeah, I think of... everything will happen kind of at the same time. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just, I was just thinking with Adam back. Um, I... He said in one of the panel discussions, it's not really, you know, we're not in that stage where it's user friendly. And I was like, I posted, you know, sort of an answer to him. It was like, um, you know, it would be awesome if we had finally like a like a ready to buy affordable, uh, you know, ready to go kit like a real small kit with all the, you know, antenna stuff and, and just, you know, plug and play that. I mean, this is, this would be the ultimate dream of, of me personally to, to bring this on, you know, for, for the masses of people. And then we can just jump, you know, like by leaps. Yeah. And I think all of that will happen. Um, so I, I think there's so much stuff going on and uh, the, the guys that are building the node lid, for example, and uh, we have the Casa Hodel and other devices that are just plug and play devices that you can have just like a PlayStation or like a network attached storage. If, you, if you're into that kind of stuff, you will get one of those and just plug it in, plug in the power cord and plug in your network cable and then you're good to go. And as Matt said, I think those kind of nodes will then they can be used by the whole family and by friends as well and so on. And you can use your mobile devices to connect to them. But I also think that we will have full notes on mobile devices. And I mean, there are a bunch of projects that are working on, on running full notes on uh, Android devices and phones are getting stronger pretty much every week. And I, I think this will, yeah, it, it will kind of work out in the next couple of years that notes are easier to run and popping up everywhere. I also think that custodial solutions will get better and better and better. And I think there, there will also be something like, you know, like trust minimized custodial solutions, if that makes sense, that you have something like that where you just have maybe some trusted notes or, or what have you. I don't, I don't want to get any hate from, from uh, hardcore Bitcoiners because, of course, you should run your own note. But uh, in a way, most people probably will not. And in regards to mesh networks, uh, I think the, uh, you know, the, um, necessity is the mother of all invention. It's, it's what they say, right? Yeah. So if you kind of need to use mesh networks because your government has the tendency to shut down the internet or block communication, then you will use mesh networks for sure. And uh, I think also where there are enough, enough people and enough hobbyists, it will be easy to use mesh networks because it's just, yeah, as Matt said, a backup and uh, sort of like a, a second sense as well uh, for your node, like the satellite link. <laughs> we have five senses to know what's going on. And if you have multiple connections um, to receive blocks, then that's some, something like two or three different senses for your node. So I, I think that's cool. You know, it's good that um, we're witnessing uh, really a, a exponential rate of um, of development and innovation in this space. But, you know, I, I want to come back and zoom out again. For me, again, the, 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 um, the real essence of this, uh, you know, Bitcoin, I call it the monitor root layering of Bitcoin, is really to, to somehow uh, uh, make every, uh, like at least, you know, uh, a couple of million, a billion people until the year 2024 or 2028, that's, uh, you know, by coincidence, that that uh, the the time of the you know the next and next and next halving, uh, to to you know to to hold to <laughs> to to control to ho own just a fraction, a smallest fraction of a Bitcoin, and during that time and until then, 
the technology is going to be so much matured, so easy and user friendly. And I think this, this should be the process. Uh, what do you guys think? I mean, from the overall strategy, uh, what is needed here in this space? I mean, if, if the, <laughs> if the guys from the Node podcast are right, then uh, hyperbit condensation will happen and people will, will flock to stacking sets anyway. <laughs> Everyone will try to get at least one Satoshi or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I, I think adoption will, uh, again, it will continue to come in waves and I think price will be the main driver. But I also think, um, as we said before, that uh, people will adopt it out of necessity. And I mean, there's, there are many people right now that use Bitcoin out of necessity because they are in some countries where it's the best option to send money back home to your family or to your friends or to whoever needs it. And it's just the best way for money to cross borders right now. And um, yeah, I think Alex can uh, say something about that as well because he just prepared to cross some borders and um, it's it's not exactly easy right now, correct? <laughs> yeah, 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 well, do you know what I've just been doing for the last 20 minutes is I went and bought like, cause I'm gonna be after the SF, I'm flying into London. So I went and bought some pounds, right? And for the last 20 minutes, I can't remember where the fuck I put that cash. <laughs> 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 so I've been like rummaging through everything. I, just, I finally found it, that's why I sat down. But it's, man, it's a pain in the ass. Um, to, before I touch on to like, you know, some of the stuff that I've got to do, like to, to go to the U S um, you know, just, just for, you know, using Gigi's words of hygiene is, um, uh, to, to, to your point, Kev, uh, I think, um, I, I kind of see the, the evolution of Bitcoin, you know, in two parts is you've got, um, stage or part one or stage one being, you know, the on-ramp phase and part two or stage two being the utility phase. And, you know, I'm, we're raising some capital now for, um, for Amber or we'll be raising from next month. And, um, and, you know, I've been putting the IM together and in there, like, I mean, our IM is almost, um, which stands for information memorandums. It's like a prospectus that you give to investors. It's almost a, um, it's almost like a mini Bitcoin documentary because the first, um, you know, third of it almost, it talks about Bitcoin, um, you know, it's, you know, it's evolution to date. Um, and what the opportunity looks like moving forward. But, but I, I delineate there between uh, the on-ramp phase and the, and the utility phase. And, you know, the, the, it's all going to happen. You know, there's multiple elements that are going to happen concurrently. Nothing's linear um, in the world. But is right now, by and large, the most important thing is to build, um, you know, products and infrastructure that help uh, get uh, capital or, you know, wealth, um, from, from one, from the old world, uh, into the new world. Um, and then alongside doing that, we need to, you know, to build methods of, you know, I guess privacy, uh, anonymity and all that sort of stuff. Um, what, whilst we're doing that, just so we don't bring all of the baggage from the old world, um, into the new, um, but but somewhere in the next five, 10 years, we're going to tr transition away uh, and m move into, you know, a, a world or, or businesses, at least within the economic framework of what Bitcoin represents um, into businesses that are providing, you know, features, services, um, access, uh, et cetera, uh, that, that is completely uh, inside the Bitcoin ecosystem. And, and that comes back to, you know, at that point in time, people, you know, won't necessarily be thinking about, um, you know, Bitcoin the same way as they don't think about sort of the underlying elements of the internet as they do now. Now, you know, and, and I know people have sort of been, you know, pushing this argument for ages, which is, oh yeah, you know, people don't care what's at the bottom. You know, people don't care until they do care. Um, so that's really important. Um, so number one, you know, it does need to be built on a strong foundation, particularly if you're trying to drive concepts of you know immutability and security that that's something you can't fake um i, sh I should i'm going to touch on a story on that in a minute um blockchain uh, telling me i'm going to note this down that people don't care what's beneath um fuck is it this story will make you really angry but um <laughs> uh um 
Yeah, so, so what's going to happen is people are going to be interacting with Bitcoin primarily in uh, sats or, um, you know, microsats, millisats or whatever denomination that we're using uh, yeah, economically. And then we're going to be using applications and services that might uh, provide guarantees of, uh, you know, immutability um, or, you know, the inability to reverse um, a state or something that's happened in the real world because it's been, you know, somehow... Um, you know, hashed to or, you know, stored on, on Bitcoin. Um, but the businesses that provide those access points and charge a fee for that um, are going to be the interesting businesses of the future. And, and I don't think we can envision any of these. And, and I always just use the same analogy, which is we, we had no idea when the internet was forming what in the name of Christ we would have today. Absolutely no idea. You know, we could guess a few things and our best guess was that we we're going to do video conference calls. And the funny thing is we've got all this other shit and we still can't do video conference calls. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, there's, um, so, so I, I don't, I, I think that's sort of going to be the, um, the trajectory of adoption, but to, to quickly touch on, um, to touch on that story about this blockchain. So the, the university of Sydney was doing that. They've been doing this uh, big study, uh, in Australia um, about how blockchains can impact business SMEs in the accounting world. And lo and behold, they wanted to interview me and I was like, Oh, this is going to be fun. So, um, so, so she came in, you know, she, she saw me speak at one event and, you know, I was surrounded by two blockchainers um, and I kind of, you know, paid them my mind during, during the panel. But um, so she was like, Oh yeah, we, I, you know, I'd love you to give a slightly contrary viewpoint. And, and then I kind of really blew it up and I'm going to get the transcript off her and put it up on a, um, just as a podcast so people can listen to it. But she told me this story of someone saying that, you know, they, they were building a blockchain for provenance, right. And, you know, the provenance for diamonds um, so that people can know where the diamonds come from and it's, you know, immutable and secure so that, you know, that, that can't be changed. And I was like, <laughs> for the love of Christ, I was like, that, uh, you know, first of all, that's false um, because, you know, and obviously going into the details of, you know, who's running that blockchain, you know, if it's them, you know, then there is no immutability there. They just go and change it. And if it's, um, you know, if it's their own consortium of um, people, what's the incentive to, to run those nodes? Um, th 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 there's nothing, there's no actual um, service there. And then she said something really interesting. She said, oh, well, you know, this person argued that, you know, consumers and people don't really care what's going on on the bottom in the same way that they don't care um, what's happening, you know, on the internet, which protocols being used, whether it's HTTP, you know, with email, whether it's IMAP, FSMTP, you know, people care about the abstracted feature on the top. And I said, no, 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 you can't use that argument in this situation because with the internet, you don't care which protocol you're using because when you, for example, post something on the internet and let's say put something on Facebook or write a blog or something, you can have a friend, you have a guarantee that, that those um, packets of data have been routed on the internet. You don't give a shit which um, protocol was used or how it got there, but you know that that was routed um, because you can jump on another browser or something else and you can see that something's changed uh, on the internet. So, so th that's your guarantee there, but to go out and sell people a service and tell them that it's immutable, um, when it's absolutely not, I was like, this is fraud. This is, um, this is bullshit. In that sense, you can't, people will care what's beneath because then, you know, you can't give that same guarantee. Like we're, we're talking about two different things here. So it's just interesting how deranged, um, some of these people are in, um, you know, in the blockchain space that um, they're trying to basically peddle shit. That's a complete fucking lie. Um, but anyway, also, sorry, also, also just to jump in on the rant because it drives me mad as well. Everyone's behaving like they solved the Oracle problem because also with the diamonds, you have the Oracle problem that you have yep. to make sure that the right data is put in and so on and so forth. But, uh, I, I think what you said before uh, is right. You said that, people don't care until they do. And I think that's true for the internet as well. And we saw in the last couple of years, huge global debates about net neutrality. And this is directly related with the protocols that are used and what you can do with it. And if you can do deep backend inspection and so on and so forth. And I think people 
instinctively kind of care about privacy, but they don't really realize it and they especially don't realize it online. But if you go to a random person and tell them, hey, just hand me a phone unlocked and I just want to look through your phone and photos and everything, they, they will think that you're mad and they won't give you the phone. The same is just in the real world. I mean, I, I'm guessing all of you guys have, have curtains on your windows. I mean, Alex, I can see your curtains in the background and <laughs> so, sometimes my, my security protocol right there. Yeah, there you go. And, and there's a reason for that. And people like to just, um, yeah, draw those curtains for certain situations. And you also close the door when you go to the toilet. So the, I, I just don't buy the argument that, um, people don't care about privacy. Uh, everyone is like, yeah, I don't have anything to hide. If that would be true, everyone would be oh, shitting out in the open. You know what I mean? Exactly I mean, right. It's such a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange. Uh, it's a strange idea, and I, I, uh, I really like um, the old internet comic and the internet saying that on the internet nobody cares if you're a dog, and uh, it's an old New Yorker cartoon. And I, I hope that we can return to an internet where it really doesn't matter who you are and your identity it doesn't matter too much and you can change identities and switch identities and just like in the real world i mean even if you're a dog and you have like a five dollar bill in your mouth and you walk up to a hot dog stand you 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 i'm pretty sure that the guy at the hot dog stand will just give you a sausage and take the five dollars you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> it should be the same thing uh, online i mean it, it shouldn't matter what identity you have if you have the money you just you will get the service or you will get the good and um yeah identity is it's a weird thing anyway i mean uh, i don't i don't think that anyone has one fixed identity no matter how hard facebook or other entities would like to make you believe that i i think that identity is prismatic and you're not the same person at work uh, and you're like you're so a different true. persona whether you're at work or whether with your friends or with your spouse or with your kids or whatever and uh, i think we should try to emulate all those real world features online as well and this is true for payments as well so if i'm a robot dog and i want to buy a hot dog then i should be able to do that so true so true maddie did you want to add anything to that because then I, I wanted to ask you a bit of a privacy question uh Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. <laughs> A man of many words. <laughs> um, I'm going to, hold on. Let me just put another note here. Packing for the U S you know, Matt, Matt might be a dog and just use some text to speech software. We don't know. <laughs> no, no, we saw him. We saw him. <laughs> it was, it was his avatar. Um, so quick, quick question on privacy. So th there's, you know, I, I'm. I know which way I lean, but I, I want to sort of see which way Matt leans on the the idea of um, privacy, um, you know, at the protocol layer or privacy um, at upper layers. And and there's um, the, there's you know the the, the Bitcoin plebs, um, you know, Gigi. I know you're you're in that group, Matt. I don't, I don't know if I've seen you in that group, but um, <laughs> you know, there's like Dita Bob and all those guys there who are um. You know, Why do I regret it some days? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm in there, but I'm not active. Oh, dude, me neither. Like, it's just too hard to like. The <laughs> space is brutal. I love them though. I love them. It's kind of like the 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 definition of a stubborn minority, right? Um, but um, you know, I know Dita Bob's has, has kind of um posted this a couple times about you know not uh building uh privacy fundamentally into the into the base layer versus someone like Udi um who kind of promotes the um the opposite. And I understand uh you know. Dita Bob's um, point, which is in order for this to one day become a, you know, a monetary layer or network that we can build on top of, you know, that, that ability to, um, to inspect um, or, or, you know, that, that publicly, um, that, that public availability, you know, needs to be there for us to uh, be able to build a robust system that, you know, so he's sort of talking about the bigger picture here in the sense that, you know, Bitcoin not being just a, you know, a, a, a dark uh, money or a dark uh, monetary system. Um, I don't, it's, it's an interesting philosophical argument. I mean, on both sides, because then, you know, what one could argue that, look, you know, Bitcoin isn't going to replace everything, but what we should do is we should optimize to, you know, build our own um, 
economic network that's just you know anyone can opt into and then you know you can operate on which kind of kind of leans more towards you know the you know the eric foskel side of the argument i don't know the, the, there's a lot to unpack there but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts matt on you know sort of which way you lean and what your thoughts are so well so first of all it's a um a very contentious topic uh mm. so no matter what, there's going to be a ton of people that disagree with me. Uh, I, I think that privacy is extremely important. Um, I think also, uh, it's undeniable that there's a lot of value in Bitcoin's transparency. Um, so really at the, at the end of the day, what I think the market will demand and what I think we need is the ability to send someone a payment privately where they're not able to see all your past transactions and all your future transactions. And ideally at the same time, be able to verify the supply and have some level of transparency there at the same time. So, you know, I, I, I don't think that we should rush to push anything like experimental into, um, into, into the layer one, into any kind of consensus changes or anything like that. But I think that when the time comes, that you know there's there's actual tested um technology there's actual tested uh implementations of of things we can go and at the same time the market demands it then we will see that um i i i do have concerns um if if the if the status quo was to be maintained but it doesn't appear that the status quo is being maintained it appears that we have a lot of uh, promising improvements coming uh, towards privacy with the within the current, uh, you know, protocol limitations, and 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 we can then work, you know, work from there. But you know, if if we had, for instance, like something like uh, like the Zcash inflation bug, uh, that could be that could absolutely just destroy this whole project. It would just you know yeah. Yeah. could completely ruin faith. The only reason it wasn't bad on Zcash was because no one was using it. Um, (laughs) But if you imagine that like a huge pool of users are using it and then like three developers find out that this, there's an experimental, there's a flaw in their, in their code. um, Like that's a fucking disaster. So uh, that really needs to be avoided. um, And, and, you know, and and take it from there. I do think that at the end of the day, um, we've entered an era of, essentially free market money and i i think that i think that the market will ultimately demand the best money possible um and i that's where i deviate a lot from people uh in terms of forks uh i i think we just haven't seen any good forks and that's why they're they're you know they i think if, if a fork fails then it, it turns it, it becomes a minority fork and it and it trends to zero long term but i think that we could have situations where you have a strong developer team with a, a strong uh, implementation change and and the market ends up demanding that that is uh, the better money. Interesting. Um, Cause on, on that note of, um, cause I think when you said the, the ability to send money without, so I'm going to go back to near the beginning of what you were talking about is um someone not being able to see all your, you know, historical and future transactions. Cause uh, you know, I think, and I think that's fundamentally important. Um, and, and I mean, you know, obviously you can coin join it along the way. So that way you can obfuscate that and make it a bit harder. Um, but I, I wonder in the next five or 10 years, whether, you know, the, the, the volume of people just operating on lightning, which is fundamentally more, um, more private is going to negate the need um, to try and, you know, um, build uh, fundamental obfuscation inside um, layer one outside of things like, you know, the ability to coin join and everything like that, which are basically, um, you know, functions that work on layer one as opposed to um, inherent um, abilities um, or, or, or inherent privacy in la- layer one. So, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough one for me, man, because like if we, um, I, I don't know which way to swing on this. Um, because I, I do believe that in the future, more people will be using, um, lightning and abstracted layers than, than, 
than base uh, Bitcoin. I, I think we're we're sort of the lucky freaks um, and weirdos that decided to get in early, um, and we're sort of playing around and sent. Like I, I kind of feel like in ten years' time we'll look back and be like. Remember when you used to send Bitcoin to people directly from a Bitcoin address? Like, what the <laughs> fuck were we thinking? You know, it's like, you know, you're showing everyone all your previous transactions and we're screwing around with all this stuff. Like, it's going to seem so foreign, um, I, I think, in 10 years because the, the way we're going to transact is going to change, I, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think... I think coin joins, especially user-friendly coin joins... Uh, uh, with Wasabi and now with Samurai um, are a huge step forward. Um, I don't think they're enough. Uh, I, you know, the key issue is, is also you need to get enough people using them, um, which is kind of what I've made my personal goal, at least for the short term, is to just get coin join usage up. Um, but, but then you have two other issues where you have, it comes with an additional fee burden. So, so to be private on the network, it's going to cost you more. Like people like to to talk about Schnorr and Music, um, which which should make uh, transactions that are coin join transactions cheaper than regular transactions. But you still have to do multiple rounds of coin join transactions. So it's always going to cost you more money. Um, that could be limited potentially, like you said, with other layers. You know, if you if you're funding a, a lightning a lightning node that's running through Tor. Uh, that might, you know, reduce your need to remix. Uh, we c there could be some interesting things there. It's hard to really. I mean, Lightning's had beaten all my expectations so far, so I don't want to like um, project too far into the future uh, mm -hmm. with that. But there's some interesting elements there. I mean, I was talking to someone about like a coin join ban, and like there's things, you know, just things like going into Lightning and coming out of lightning or going into like a, a federated side chain, like liquid or something, and then coming out, like, how do you, the, it, the reality of the situation is privacy is, uh, it's very easy to leak your data with Bitcoin right now. Um, it drew me it, like menial things that people don't even think about, you know, like how they, uh, when they look up their address on a block explorer or something and they're yeah. like broadcasting their IP or they're signed into Facebook at the same time. Um, or if they text someone an address or if they DM someone on Twitter an address or they even worse, if they actually tweet it out, um, there's all these different issues where there's these pitfalls. And because it's a, because it's a transparent immutable blockchain, if you mess up, like someone doesn't even have to realize right away, they can connect all the dots 10 years in the road, down the road and really screw you. Um, so, so there's, there's a lot of improvements to be made, but at the same time, anyone who hacks funds from exchanges hasn't had, as long as they're patient, they haven't had any issues really getting, getting the money, you know, uh, you know, getting, getting through any kind of blocks or anything like that. Um, so, you know, you really start to see issues if, if we have, um, and this was more worrisome during when, when mining was, it seemed to be a lot more centralized. I think we're going to be trending uh, to more distributed over time, which should be good. Um, but if, if you have people censoring transactions on the minor level, if pools are saying, you know, this is the Binance hacker, we're not going to allow any transactions to confirm from these addresses. Then we're gonna we're gonna start having major issues, and so if that happens, just like Gigi was saying earlier, uh, you know, if, if you need to, if necessity is the driver of all of all this innovation, like if you need to do that, then the market will will demand a solution to that. I don't think Bitcoiners will be fine with um, with certain transactions not being able to move, or or certain UTXOs being forever tainted and not being able to be spent. Like if 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 there's any kind of enforcement or action there that's the least bit effective, you will see, um, you'll see responses hit the market. Yeah, I also think yeah, there's we'll... too much competition for that to ever work. I mean, there, somebody will be jumping in and someone will mine this transaction, you know? Exactly. I mean? It's a very competitive market. And since you touched on the, all the ways you can leak privacy, shout out uh, to 6102 Bitcoin from Bitcoin only, he made a, an awesome FAQ for HODL privacy and he lists all the ways you can leak your privacy there. So, um, yeah, that was really good. I'll, a lot of ways. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. Um, I'll send it to you, Kevin, so you can put it in the show notes. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to 
push on this one just just in a, another couple of ways. So speaking of market um, money, so you know, let's say, um, and and I'm not I'm not playing you know supporter or against here. I'm just um, you know digging. Um, let, let's say we we you know push towards um, you know a more fundamentally private um, base layer. Um, you know, and let, let's say, for example, it uh, rivals something like, you know, Monero, not, not, not in the same capacity, but let's say it rivals something in Monero or, or it gets thrown in the same basket um, as this, you know, private uh, uh, layer one um, money. Do, do you think, I'm almost seeing two parts here. You've got one path where something like that potentially gets banned off, you know, any exchange um, or any let's not even call them exchanges let's just say the on-ramps become far more difficult for that um, versus you know that one there which maintains um, the sanctity so you end up getting you know the the, the new capital or the market um, going into the, the version that is um, still more you know I guess transparent at um, at layer one and, you know, I wonder if it's more, I think it's more of a timing question is like, when do we do it? When, when the, um, or, or how that evolves as opposed to one or the other, because there's going to be a point in time when, you know, the, the, the amount of capital and participants sitting on Bitcoin, you know, is, is strong enough that you can, you know, go ahead and increase um, privacy without, worrying too much about um tightening up you know the, the capital on ramps but i mean maybe that's a moot point I, I don't know there's like so many variables here but um i don't know if anyone's got a you know comment on that or if we just leave it there i mean i i feel like i feel like we'd end up in the situation where you would where we would need to implement uh you know additional privacy uh, you know, move farther towards privacy on the trade-off scale with verifiability um, or like transparency, I guess. I don't know what the right word is, but you that, that situation would happen in a situation where they were already essentially banning self-custody of Bitcoin in the first place. Um, because I feel like that's where you would actually get the demand to, to make that trade-off. Like if, if, if you, if we don't see, which I don't think we will, to be honest, but if we don't see like widespread coin join, um, blacklists and stuff like that, um, there might not be, I, I, I'm not sure. Like, I, I feel like in the situation where we're, we're moving towards more towards Monero's trade-offs that they've chosen, um, is a situation where Bitcoin's already got its back up against the wall more so than it does right now anyway. Um, and I feel like that's the least of your concerns. The least of your concerns is like at that point, the fiat on ramps, off ramps are already, like out of the question. Yep, yep. They're already like kind of you know, not even in the picture anymore. Okay. That makes sense. Makes sense. Thanks for exploring that, man. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I just want to say something. I mean, I got to emphasize this. We are far away from user friendliness. And this is something, such a desire of me, you know, to bring this, break this down for people. I mean, just, just this, uh, I mean, it's a great thing, you know, that um, that link that you sent me, uh, Gigi, but from uh, is that 6102 Bitcoin is you know, there, I mean, I understand, you know, every average person, you know, has a self responsibility and shouldn't be sloppy or negligent. Um, but when it comes to these kind of things, it's, um, you know, I can only say this is like, uh, these instructions is, is really for people like you guys who are already experienced, you know, technically, technologically, we have a background in, you know, knowledge. Uh, so this is why it's so important for me to uh, to implement this step by step. I mean, just hodling it is already obviously a big challenge. Uh, like making people to you know buy yeah. a, a few satoshis and hodl it. That's like the, the this is like the essence of the, of this whole monetary root layering of Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I mean, not not spending the bitcoins is also a challenge. You're, you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I I think 
<laughs> I think all of that will come and um, uh, to jump on what you guys said in regards to layer one and layer two, I think uh, we will have improvements on every layer. And I also hope that we will have improvements in the whole ecosystem. And just uh, for example, um, Bull Bitcoin just implemented um, privacy by default because they now use uh, Wasabi coin joints for all their transactions and if you buy bitcoin in canada using bull bitcoin or you use the bill service all your coins will be private and um they even went so far to say that um as as far as they are interpreting the canadian law it's their responsibility to do that and everyone who is operating in canada has to do the same in a way and i i, I think that's an, an awesome first step to have a company just step up and say okay we're using the wasabi cli we're using the, the technology that's there and we are um and we are just coin joining all the transactions by default and i think that's the way to go and then uh you don't have to be that technical and you i i, I agree with you now it's just quite complicated but it's we, we we also must not forget how far we have already come because a couple of years ago just um, using Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin was really complicated. And now we have uh, awesome on-ramps and off-ramps and services to take Bitcoin. And we have wallets that are really user-friendly and you don't need to use any CLI or any command line interface. So you don't need to be a computer wizard to use any of this stuff. And I think it will just improve on on so many levels. And uh, yeah, it, it like... It, it, for me, it feels that everything is evolving at the same time in five different directions and it just gets better and better and better and hopefully also more private. I'd, I'd like to add that, uh, that I feel like there's all the alternatives, like there's no, there's no more, like there's all the alternatives are, are less private anyway. Um, so even, even with Bitcoin at its current status quo, um, you know, besides like the altcoin, the altcoin landscape, but they're making other trade-offs. Um, but if you look at like traditional payment processors, you look at banks, um, you look at governments moving to ban cash and remove cash from the circulation and switch to digital payments. Like those are already panopticons. Like if we, if, if Bitcoin fails, the, the result is going to be a surveillance society in terms of all financial transactions and, and in terms of probably other things too. Um, so, so Bitcoin is that, is that solution there and it, it, it just, it will develop. It will, you know, the part of the beauty of Bitcoin's game theory is that, is that stakeholders want to see it grow, want to see it improve. Um, and that you have greedy people around the world who want to build businesses and services around it to make money themselves. And, uh, and that, that human desire for greed is just, it, it, it'll work, it'll work itself out. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that is the, I love that last bit there, man. It, it's, that is literally, this is the most elegantly and <laughs> this is the most elegantly designed thing in history and, and how it's evolved. There's, there's nothing like it. And that's why nothing can come, come close to it. And, and it, it is like, I, I sometimes reckon Satoshi was either some dude from the future who um came from like, you know, somewhere which was like, all right, surveillance state you know 2084 right <laughs> it's like all right, we fucked this one up let's go back and give these idiots something um sort of get out of jail because it's like we, we we are literally this is the last bit of hope um you know my, my sister she's um she, she, she's an interesting um girl so she's she's a dancer and all this sort of stuff and she's like she's fundamentally like she, she, she doesn't get into all the Jordan Peterson, all the politics stuff and everything that we, um, you know, that probably all of us are into. Um, you know, she, she doesn't even have Facebook or Instagram or any of that sort of shit. So she's like her, her ideal life is, you know, living by a fucking Creek with a little cottage and, you know, doing her shit. Right. But, um, we, we had this interesting conversation cause she's like so far away from Bitcoin and tech and all that sort of stuff that, um, she doesn't know anything about it. And, you know, I managed to get her interested in Bitcoin around this um, discussion of, you know, privacy and, you know, the right to live your own life without, you know, being surveilled or told what to do and, um, and all that sort of stuff. So, so, so people do, it does matter to people. And, and by the way, my sister's only 22, 23. So she's like, you know, part of this small cohort of, um, of 
younger millennials, you can call them, I guess. Uh, I don't know if she still qualifies as a millennial, maybe. Um, that, you know, that, that are actually um, interested in that and, and they're out there. And, you know, Bitcoin literally represents the last uh, opportunity for all of them and us, um, you know, to, to, to live in a free society um, without having to worry about, you know, our door being open while we're taking a shit, basically. Um, <laughs> totally agree with you. If, if this monetary root laying is not going to succeed, because it's the fabric of our society, of our civilization. I think, I don't know what kind of direction we're going to go. I mean, not besides surveillance, I mean, it's going to probably merge with something like transhumanistic surveillance bullshit. So I really don't know how we're going to evolve, to be honest with you. That's my personal opinion. I think that's the top urgency, you know, to mass adopt this as, as fast. But maybe, you know, the job is already done for us. That's why I'm, I want to ask you, is that, I mean, is the cat out of the, uh, is the, cat out of the bag? Has the Pandora spark, has been, the Pandora oh, it, spark it been open? 100%. 100%. Yeah, what Matt said, th 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 this is game theoretically. Like when, when people ask me now is, you know, uh, you know, what was the chances of it? I think it's already done like you know whilst yes there is lots of work to be done and all this sort of stuff um just looking at the network effects and i wrote about this in that bitcoin times um piece that i did where you know i really kind of delved into the the network effects and everything of like how much of a like steam engine this is this is a snowball and this isn't getting any smaller and and i actually don't think this is going to stop so Whilst, you know, all of this work that we're doing is important in the podcast and the education and the, the on-ramps that we're building and all of this sort of stuff is critical. Like we are all um, in our own way uh, incentivized to do this because we are stakeholders, because this is the first uh, piece of, you know, infrastructure as a species that we've built that doesn't suffer from a tragedy of the commons you know like whilst we work in our own self-interest we are building something that is in the in the interest of everybody it's there's nothing like that that doesn't exist anywhere else yeah it's like the opposite of the tragedy of the commons it is man it is it's it's the prosperity of the commons man right here and like <laughs> and once you realize it you're just trying to accumulate as much bitcoin as possible <laughs> that's it man that's the game bro yeah that's how it is yeah i i also think uh bitcoin can't be stopped really i i think it can't be killed maximally it can be subverted just like the internet was subverted in a in a way but i i'm i'm very very hopeful and um i i'd like to read just two paragraphs of the cypherpunk manifesto because it points it out so nicely and it's awesome that it's it's kind of an old uh, an old document in internet time, but I think it sums up nicely what we just talked about the last hour or so. And um, I removed some parts, so it's I, I just focus on the privacy aspect. And it says privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Since we desire privacy, we must ensure that each party to each party to a transaction have knowledge only of that which is directly necessary for the transaction. Therefore, privacy in an open society requires anonymous transaction systems. Until now, cash has been the primary such system. An anonymous transaction system is not a secret transaction system. We, the cypherpunks, are dedicated to building anonymous systems. We are defending our privacy with cryptography, with anonymous mail forwarding systems, with digital signatures, and with electronic money. Cypherpunks write code. I think that's just so awesome. It's so beautiful. Legendary. And, uh, that, that just brought chills down my spine, man. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, th I think we should all be a little bit more cypherpunks uh, and, and do what we can to just write code and also use and apply the code that is already there. Mix our coins and yeah, take care of our privacy. And I, I, I want to, to end this on, on a note. Um, you all know the uh, Chaos Communication Congress probably from Germany and they have also a, a nice podcast and radio show. It's the, um, all started, I think, in the 70s or 80s from the um, Chaos Computer Club. And they always end every show with, um, I'll say it in German first, Lasst euch nicht überwachen und verschlüsselt immer schön eure Backups, which means don't let yourself be surveilled and always encrypt your backups. And I think that's something to live by. <laughs> and it sums it up nicely. You, you just always encrypt your backups. That already implies that you should create backups and just encrypt everything and then you're good to go. Yeah. 
the key Perfect is again, user man. friendliness the key is user friendliness again i mean if we can just <laughs> achieve this you know it'd be much much easier just you know this is what we need it's like the internet the telephone it just you know we don't know what i don't know how it works but <laughs> I just do it, you know, this is what we need to achieve. Uh, but I guess, you know, with that exponential rate of uh, innovation development. Um, so guys, what are your concluding, uh, Matt, JJ, uh, Alex, what are your concluding thoughts? What are your final thoughts? What's your vision? When is it gonna be the, the tipping point? I think that the conditions are compounding to be, I feel it. It's like, I mean, look at everywhere, you know, I mean, just, just look at the gold price, gold price. people are re literally, uh, desiring and, and, and are desperate to, to, you know, to, to store the values into something, you know, hard, hardest, um, scarcest. Uh, what do you, what, what is your, what is your vision? I don't know. I'm going to chime in quickly. I, I think, um, I think Gigi closed it off perfectly there, man, to, to be honest. I, I, um, I, I think the tipping point's going to come. Oh, I think it already came. Um, and then we're just going to meet multiple other tipping points. Um, you know, the, but basically, you know, the saying haters going to hate, like, you know, scammers going to scam, government's going to government, <laughs> politicians going to politic, and, you know, stupidity is going to be stupid. Like, the, all, all this shit's going to happen anyway. We got Bitcoin, um, you know, encrypt your backups, <laughs> everything that Gigi just said. <laughs> um, yeah, man, like, I, I, I think that was a perfect ending. And um, I, I don't know if you guys want to add anything else to that. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to encrypting the fuck out of my shit before I land in LAX. <laughs> <laughs> Very good idea. I, I, you know, I, I think I agree. The tipping points already happened. Now it's just a matter of time, how quick it, how quick it goes from here. Um, and, and, and what we do is, is I think Bitcoin's inevitable. We just, um, John Carvalho mentioned this uh, on the podcast with us the other day. Um, it's inevitable already. We just are, are deciding how quick that's going to happen. And um, in the meantime, just stay humble and stack sets. That's it, man. That's it. Wonderful. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I think my listeners too, they're going to love it. And yeah, talk to you soon, hopefully. See you on Twitter, guys. guys. Have thank a good flight, so Alex. Bye-bye, Matt. Bye, Gigi. Take thank care. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye.